welcome to Calvary. We're so glad that you've joined us today because today is Communion Sunday. So take a moment, gather the elements so you can participate with us later in the service. If you're joining us for the first time today, a very special welcome to you. We would love to get to know you today. So click the welcome tab at the bottom of your screen. Let us know who you are. A member of our team will connect with you later this week. And we have a Starbucks gift card to send you. A big thank you to all of our Calvary family for your continued generosity. You have contributed to ministry around the world. You can continue to partner with us by giving online, following the directions at your bottom of your screen. Giving is safe and easy. All right, Calvary, let's worship. the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the waging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord.
we take a few moments to prepare our hearts, prepare ourselves to partake in the Lord's Supper, to celebrate communion together, the, the instruction that we are given is to examine ourselves, to take time and reflect. And it's an opportunity for us to really stop and take time and reflect on what Jesus has done in our lives. It's an opportunity to respond in gratitude for everything that Jesus has accomplished already and to look forward to the future hope that we have of everything that Jesus has promised to us. And it's because he's already kept every single one of his promises and he continues to keep his promises. He is faithful. So as we look back and remember what Jesus accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago, we recognize that as he hung there, he paid the price for our wrongdoings, for our moral failures, for our sin. And he did it so that we could be brought into his family. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed so that a new covenant could be written one that's not about what we do and, and how we accomplish things. It's, it's about what Jesus has done and has already accomplished. And the only way I can think to respond is thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And I look forward to the future hope of all that you have promised. So let's read these words and partake of these emblems and remember Jesus' amazing sacrifice. Paul records that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's receive together. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing sacrifice for your amazing love. We thank you for what you have accomplished in each one of our lives, what you accomplished 2,000 years ago and what you accomplished when we met you at whatever point that was in our lives. And we look forward to the future hope of eternity with you where the effects of sin are completely removed and we get to enjoy eternity free from the burden and the effects of sin. We thank you that all of our moral failures and wrongdoings hung to the cross with you and that you paid the price. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Hey, this is Vince. I'm so glad you're able to join us for church this morning. If there's something going on in life that you want someone to join with you in prayer for, uh, make sure you hit that live prayer button and someone on my team will make sure that they connect with you and pray for whatever's going on. Now, let's head into the message. Give our speaker some love in the chat and let's get into it.
Hello and welcome to episode two of our Binging the Bible series. This is a series where we're looking at two questions and, and answering them in order to understand the Bible better and why we should be reading it and applying it in our lives on a regular basis. Those two questions are, why should we read the Bible and why should we believe the Bible? Last week, Pastor Mark explained why we should read the Bible. He took us through uh, what the Bible is, that it's 66 different books written over the course of over a thousand years by 40 different authors in multiple languages. And it seems like they shouldn't connect, but yet they do connect and tell a single cohesive story. And it's a story of God's working in humanity and how we can know him. And so, and then he also took time to tell us about how we can um, approach reading the Bible ourselves through Bible reading plans and the various ways that we can do that. And today we're going to take time and look at why we should believe the Bible. For anyone who doesn't know who I am, my name is Brad Fennell, and, and I'm the student ministries pastor here at Calvary, and I've been doing that job for about five years now. And I've been married to my wife, Melissa, for six years, and we have three or two kids. Our daughter, Raylan, is three, and our son, Kyson, is seven months old today, which is exciting for us, but he has no idea what's going on. Um, and... Uh, when we look at sort of the way the world is today, it's changed a lot in how we consume information and content over the past 10 years or so. Just, just a couple weeks ago, my daughter uh, was, was home with me, and, and it was pouring rain, so there wasn't much for us to do. We had played a lot, and then she said, Daddy, I want to watch something. So I went on to, to Netflix to get her something to watch, and she's got a bunch of shows that she watches on a regular basis. And the thing is, she didn't want to watch any of those shows, so I asked her if she wants to watch Star Wars. And if you go down to my office, you'll probably see and get a sense that I like Star Wars a little bit. And even if you think about my kids' names a little bit, you might go, eh, maybe he likes Star Wars a little too much. Um, but anyway, uh, we ended up finding some Lego Star Wars shows, and we started watching them. But we watched them all day. And she wanted to watch them over and over again. And I asked my wife about this. She's a preschool teacher, and she said kids like repetition. And the truth is, is that I don't think that goes away so much as it just kind of adapts and changes. Because what we see happening in our world today is that we consume information and lots of it in one go. And oftentimes we like watching and returning to the same things over and over again. We have widespread access to TV shows and movies and music and information through Netflix and other streaming services, YouTube and other websites or podcasts or whatever. We have tons of access. And so our consumption, our binging of things has increased. But at the same time, we've also been given more widespread access to the Bible than ever before. We got traditional paper formats. We got websites that give you every translation imaginable. We got apps. We got audio. audio. We've even got uh, uh, Bible TV shows being produced. Um, there is access to learn about God and to read his word, either, either in print or audio, all over the place. But yet, biblical literacy and rates of reading the Bible have decreased significantly over the past 10 years. And, and, it's, and it's been going on longer than that, but it keeps on decreasing. And when I, when I ask young people about whether or not they read the Bible, if they don't, it often comes up that th they don't know how to start or that they, they don't understand what the Bible really is, which is what Pastor Mark tackled last week. But it also comes up that they don't know if it's even worth reading because is it even trustworthy? How do we know that what we have written down today is what was written originally? And they also just go, I don't know how it applies to me today. So today we're going to take time to answer both of those questions. And in doing so, I hope to answer the question, why should we believe the Bible? Before we do that, I just want to provide two verses for an answer for why we should re read the Bible, sort of a base level. And the first, the first verse is in Psalm 119, verse 105. Now, Psalm 119 is a, is a book that is a, is a really long chapter. It might as well be a book that focuses a lot on the Word of God. But this passage, a very well-known passage is, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now, that might not be such a big deal to us today, but back in, in the ancient world, a light 
was the only way to see at night. I mean, it's the same thing today, but if you were out at night, it could be dangerous. There could be stuff on the pathway that you couldn't see unless you had a lamp with you, and then you could see the way forward. And that's what the Bible gives us. It gives us a way forward in life. When we can't see what's coming next, the Bible gives us a way forward. And going, going forward, in Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. So the Bible calls us forward in Christ, uh, uh, giving us instruction and encouraging us to have the hope of, of the things that Christ has promised us. So the Bible is important, and believing it is important. But you could be here and thinking, well, I don't know if I believe the Bible. I don't know if the Bible's trustworthy or not, or I don't know if it's relevant for me. Or maybe you're here and you're thinking, you know what, I trust the Bible. I believe it's relevant, so I don't know what this has to do with me. Well, if you're in that second camp, I can almost guarantee you that there is someone that you know, someone you love, someone you care about, who has a problem with one or both of these, or may one day have a problem with one or both of these. Because a very loud voice that is coming at people online today, especially people who live online, is that the Bible is not trustworthy, that the Bible is not what it says it is, or that what is written in the Bible is not what is, was originally written, that it's been changed. These are all things that we can actually address and, and talk about. So that's where we're going to start. Is the Bible trustworthy? Is what was written down 2,000 years ago what we have today? Years ago, I had a conversation with somebody who I knew was not a Christian. And he said to me, I have read the Bible twice, cover to cover, in its entirety. And when he said that, it really, really kind of floored me. I don't even know how our conversation got to that point, but somehow it got there. And I was taken aback, and I said, you, what? You've read the Bible twice? Why? And the reason why I asked why was because, well, you, you know, at that age, I was about 22 years old, I really believed that if anyone had, had read the Bible, it would be people who believe it, that anyone who doesn't believe the Bible would have no reason to read it. And he said to me, it's an amazing story. I don't believe that it's the Word of God. I don't believe that all the stories in it actually happened. I think that it's got some good moral teaching in it in places, but it's just, it's a great story. And you know what? I'm planning on reading it again. And the whole time, I kept on wondering, why? why? And I haven't kept in contact with that person, to be honest. I have no idea if he followed through and read the Bible for a third time, or if he's read it multiple times since then, or if maybe he's been changed through the process of reading the Bible. But it brings to mind, really, this question of people can read the Bible and think it's a good thing to read, but yet not believe it, which, which at that point in my life surprised me. And now that I've spent time studying the Bible, I understand that there are people out there like him all over the place. And one of the criticisms for why we can't believe the Bible is that the Bible's been copied over and over again so many times, passed down from 2,000 years. How can we possibly know that what we have today is actually the Word of God? Which is a very good question, I think. And it's a question that a lot of scholars have dealt with. And so the first half of this, 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 uh, the, our time right now, I'm going to take some time to talk about how we can trust that what's written in the Bible is what actually was there in the beginning and how we can trust that it is what actually happened. And then I'm going to take the second half of our time and I'm going to look at a passage from the Bible and, and help us understand how that passage is relevant for today. So the second half is going to be more like a traditional sermon. The first half is going to be more like, um, more like a, uh, a kind of like a lecture, I guess. We're going through a lot of information. But I, I do think that it is very helpful. So in order to answer the question, is the Bible trustworthy, the first thing that I want to look at is, is to talk about translations. Now, in English, we have a lot of different translations. And in other languages, surprisingly, there are few per language. They're lucky to have one. Very few have more than one. And the reason for, for our English uh, changes is because our language has changed so much over time. That's one reason why we have lots of translations. There's the ESV, which I have right in front of me here. 
which, uh, which follows in the footsteps of the King James Version and tries to be as word for word as possible while maintaining some of the while maintaining some of the poetic uh, uh, forms of the King James Bible. It doesn't use the same text as the King James Bible, uh, but, it, but it does follow in that tradition. Then there's, of course, the King James and the New King James, the NIV, the NLT. There's all these different versions, and if you line them up and look at different passages, which I actually do quite often, you can see that there are differences. And we can wonder, how can there be so many differences? Well, it comes down to the traditions in which those Bibles are made, or the purpose of those Bibles. And there's two ways to do it, word for word or thought for thought. I just said the ESV goes more word for word. It tries to be as close to the original text as possible. So it sacrifices understanding for accuracy. And then it tries to be a little bit poetic as well, which, it, which goes down that road. And there are other translations that don't worry so much about the poetry and go more word for word. And then there's translations that go more thought for thought. And those translations are like the NLT. It's more thought for thought. It's easier to read and understand. It does some of the work for you to help you understand it better. So you can kind of see that there's, there's all sorts of them that fall on that spectrum. And whatever they believe about how they want their translation to be, that's how it changes. That, that's, how, that's why there are differences. And even when you look at them, you can look at them and go, well, the meaning isn't different. It's just explained in a different way, or they've chosen a certain word, and they might cho choose a big fancy word because they're trying to be as close to the original word when th another translation has chosen a word that's a little bit easier to understand or, or broken it up into a couple of words. Um, and what I say to people when they ask, what translation should I read, is just read the translation that you're going to read. Don't go, Pastor Brad likes using the, the uh, ESV or the HSCB or the NASB, which are the three I primarily use, and say, I'm going to read those because those go a little bit more word for word, and then go, this is too much for me, and then not read. Read the, the Bible that you are going to read. Read the translation that you are going to read. That is a very important thing. So that's why there's differences in translations, different philosophies behind what they're trying to do and what they're trying to accomplish that leads them to make certain choices in how they translate certain words and phrases. Whereas one might go word for more word for word and one might go more thought for thought to be more understandable. The second problem that we run into is that how can we know that what we have written down in these books is even what was, what was there originally? And that comes down to knowing and understanding how we judge historical documents. And there's really two criteria. There might be more, but the two main criteria that we use for judging how we understand and, and, and judge a historical document is, is having copies of the document that are as old as possible, essentially, as close to the original events and the original writings as possible. And then the other one is that more copies is better. And on both counts, the Bible does an amazing job. There are, there are, um, there are some that are a little different than others. Um, most of them will have between five and maybe a thousand copies of their, uh, of their, um, of their texts. The Bible has 5,800 in Greek. Sorry, just the New Testament has 5,800 in Greek. And if you count the, all the other languages like Latin, Syriatic and Coptic and, and stuff like that, you get over 23,000 up to about 25,000, depending on how you count the, the, the manuscripts, and, and we, they keep finding more all the time. And the reason why this is important is you can kind of lay them all out and you can start to see how they line up together and are they accurate and are there changes that have been made. The more you have, the more you can identify when a change has been made. And the, the, the first criteria was the older is better. Closer to the original date is better. And the, the closest fragment that we have to the original writings goes back to the early 100s AD. And that is really close to the original writings. And then from there, the earliest manuscripts are full, complete manuscripts are later, but not that much later. Whereas some of these other historical documents, like I said, might have about five copies up to a thousand. And a lot of them, the complete copies, some of them are hundreds of years later. So the Bible is actually very well attested to, and a lot of these things are, a lot of these manuscripts are very close 
to the, the close to the original writings and the original events. But what does all this mean? Well, we do see variants or differences between the texts. I'm going to throw out a, wor- a number, and it's probably a number that may alarm you, but don't worry, we're going to talk about it. We see at, at least, at minimum, depending on how you count them, but at minimum, 200,000 differences in the text. And the Bible, the New Testament, has fewer than 200,000 words. So that's often a criticism that's thrown out very quickly. There's over 200,000 errors, and there's less than 200,000 words. How, you can, how can you trust any word that is in the Bible, that is in the New Testament? Well, remember, those differences are spread out over about almost 25,000 different copies of the New Testament. So, so we got that, too. So we got that, right? So they're spread out over a lot. But right away, we can start to eliminate some of the differences as being anything too important. One of the first ways to eliminate is just spelling differences. Place names, people names, different spelling errors and differences that really have no bearing on anything, but but they're changed a little bit. Here's an example. My name is Bradley Sean Funnell. My last name is spelled F-U-N-N-E-L-L. Oftentimes, I get emails with the L, the last L, dropped off of my name. F-U-N-N-E-L. There's a variant. Now, I exist, and, 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 uh, and so we have a variant. Here's another variant. Some people spell Bradley, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y. That's how I spell it. Other people, I've seen it very rarely, B-R-A-D-L-Y. So someone could misspell my first name as well. And then that would be a variant. It doesn't change who I am or anything like that is just a ver- an error in spelling. Okay, now here's another one with my name. My name is Brad. I go by Brad most of the time. But legally, my name is Brad Lee. So if you go down to my office, on my office door, it says Brad Fennell. If, you, if I give you my business card, it says Brad Fennell. Most people call me Brad, but if I were to pull out my driver's license, it says Bradley. My passport says Bradley. All official documents say Bradley because that's my legal name. So if someone were to refer to me uh, as Brad or Bradley, it's still the same person, but that is a variant, a difference. The final one, just using my own name, is my my middle name is Sean. Now, Sean can be spelt at least three different ways, and my name is spelt S-E-A-N, which someone in my grade 7 class informed me does not spell Sean, but spells Sian. Not really a big deal, but you can see how even in someone's name, there can be multiple differences that can come up across a wide variety of documents that each include a variant. So when we take spelling errors and and spelling differences in, in those things, it removes a huge chunk of the differences. The next largest kind of difference is copying errors. Now, this is something that we probably all have dealt with if we've ever had to do a a handwritten good copy of our homework. You remember doing that, where you you would write out, and you got your thing, and you're looking at your your notes, and you go, there are 200,000 variants in the New Testament. There are 200,000. Oh, I copied the same line again. Or you skip a line. We see that kind of thing in the variants as well, and they're very easily identifiable. The last kind of variant is generally referred to as, or we can refer to as, additions to the text. Additions to the text. And that can sound a little concerning, but the fact that we know what the additions are should make us very comfortable, that it's actually very easy to identify when something's been added to the text. And an example of something that's been added to the text is the Lord, in the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. There's a difference right there. But they're not really different. There's just a little difference. But then also, many of you probably continued on and said, For for yours or thine is the kingdom, the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That last part is an addition. It came in later, 
and some Bibles include it, and some Bibles choose not to include it, and oftentimes they'll put a little footnote and say, this is an addition. Now, here's the thing about that addition. It doesn't change anything about our understanding of who God is, our understanding of how we can know Him, our understanding of salvation. It changes nothing. And it was likely just an, an addition because that was how it was prayed in a specific church. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not in the earliest manuscripts. Now, there are bigger additions that, are, that, have a little, that might seem a little bit more problematic, but let me deal with the biggest, most prominent one. It's in John chapter 7, starting in verse 53 and going until John 8, 11. It's the story of the woman caught in adultery. Now, most Bibles, including mine and, and most modern Bibles, will have a little note at the top, sometimes big brackets and different things, and kind of show you that this is not in the earliest manuscripts. But here's the thing about this text. Whether it's not in the earliest manuscripts, or it is in the earliest manuscripts, or it was an actual story, it wasn't an actual story, it doesn't add anything new about Jesus or and removing it certainly doesn't remove anything that we know about Jesus. In fact, it's very clearly in line with what Jesus did and taught. Let's go through it. He's challenged by the Pharisees. Check. He's always challenged by the Pharisees. They try to trap him. Check. They often try to trap him. He kind of gives a bit of a non-answer, but in that process teaches about not judging people um, when you yourself are dealing with sin. He's, he's talking about not hypocritically judging people when you yourself are a sinner. So you're condemning one person when you also should be condemning yourself. Check. He teaches that all the time, too. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is not Jesus' words, but can be summarizing a lot of what Jesus taught. His words were, deal with the plank in your own eye before you deal with the speck in your brother's eye. Don't judge hypocritically. And then we get him offering forgiveness. Does anyone condemn you? No, not one of them condemned me. But then we get him say a call to new life. Go forward and sin no more. And inter interestingly enough, when people quote that passage, they often forget that part. Jesus didn't just say, I don't condemn you. He said, I don't condemn you. I'm offering forgiveness, but I'm calling you to a life of repentance, to a life, to a new life. So we can see in there that even though this passage might not be in the earliest manuscripts, it doesn't change anything that we know about Jesus' character or what he did or what he taught. And in all, in all honesty, it's most likely an oral tradition that actually happened. And the reason why we believe that is because it shows up in different parts in John, and sometimes it shows up in a different gospel, in a different manuscript. So it's likely that someone really wanted to include this because it's a cool story, but it was not originally written in John's gospel. There's nothing wrong with the story, but it was likely not written in John's gospel. So when we look at all of this and we, we see that, okay, we have some variants, but they don't we know what they are, and the Bibles will generally identify what they are, it gives us confidence that what, was actu what we actually have in the Bible is what was written. And we are very, very confident. We can't say with 100% certainty, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little uh, uh, apprehensive to say a number because I've read the number, but I couldn't find it anywhere. When I was doing my research, I couldn't recall where I read it, but it's somewhere around 98 to 99% or maybe higher that we have what was originally written. And the good news is no variants change our understanding of who Jesus is. Now, the only question that's left is, well, is what was originally written actually what, what happened? And here's where archaeology is starting to catch up with, especially the Old Testament. There are times when they said, the Bible talks about Hittites, and the Hittites never existed. Then they found evidence of the Hittite nation. The Bible talks about King David, and King David, there's no evidence that he ever existed. Then they found evidence that David existed. There's no evidence of, of the, the exiles returning. Then we find the Cyrus Cylinder, and we, we find out that there's a decree of Cyrus going back, in, back from exile. There's all these different things that, that come up. And then the same thing in the New Testament. We found uh, there, there's, there's a, um, a pool that had five porticos, which is weird because they should only have four, but then they found one in Jerusalem that has five. So we start to see that the archaeological evidence proves things that are claimed in the Bible. And then we have to ask ourselves, did the disciples and the apostles have any reason to make up any of this stuff? 
And honestly, no, they all went to their death declaring that they saw Jesus resurrected. They all went to their death declaring the gospel message that is recorded for us today, that we know is what they recorded. Only one person, John, lived to old age, but he was tortured and beaten and arrested and, and all, the, all those things as well. And no one recanted their testimony. And that's just not something that people do when they know they're lying, especially when there's more than one person. And as 1 Corinthians said, Jesus appeared to up to 500 people at one time. And Paul challenges people to say, go ask them. If you don't believe me, go ask them, basically, when he says they're alive today. Many of them are alive today. So he's saying, go check the receipts if you want to know. So we can trust that what's in the Bible is what was originally written. That means, yes, we can believe the Bible and trust it. But how is this 2,000-year-old book relevant to us today? And this is where I want to take our closing time to look at a passage, to look at really actually an entire book of the Bible, to be perfectly honest with you, and show you how this book is relevant to today and to hopefully give you some understanding of how you can do this yourself when you're reading your Bible at home in your own private devotional time. If you got a Bible with you, turn your way to the book of Haggai. That's right, I said the book of Haggai. It is found between Zephaniah and Zechariah in a part of the Bible called the Minor Prophets. And this book is, um, is written to the exiles as they've come back from exile into the promised land again, into the land of Judea. And as they've come back, they've found Jerusalem and the temple are in ruins. The people who, uh, who, are, or who lived there and maybe lived with them before have taken over all the farmland. They're actually finding that the land is a little harsher to farm than they expected. They've been gone for 70 years and a lot has changed and they need to rebuild their lives. And they start focusing on rebuilding their homes and, and, and getting themselves set up in, in that way. And then God says to them, this is the, this, thus says the Lord of hosts, the people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And then the word of the Lord came by the, the hand of Haggai the prophet. It is, it is time for yourselves to, or is it time for yourselves to dwell in, in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord lies in ruin. Consider your ways. You have sown so much, you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. He starts to talk about how, don't you notice that you're going about your life and you're not thinking about the most important thing? And here we go. Do I know what it's like to, to, uh, to be working on my, my own stuff and ignoring God? Yes, that's what they were doing, right? I don't know what it's like to come back from exile. I don't know what it's like to have to build my own, to rebuild my life in that way. But I know what it's like to focus on my own stuff and ignore God. We all do. And he goes on and basically says to them, it's time to rebuild the temple. And then they do. And when they rebuild it, God says to them, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? They're looking at this new temple, and they're saying, this new temple is nothing like the old one. It's, it's kind of sad and pathetic. Is really what they're, they're sad about what they used to have. But God comes to them and says, I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, this whole situation seems very foreign to us when we look at it. And the truth is, whenever we approach a biblical text, here's some things to think about. How is it different? It's thousands of years ago. Technology is different. It's a different part of the world. Different weather patterns, different everything, different languages, different cultural practices. All these things are different. And when we identify all those differences, we can start to say, okay, there are differences. And then we can start to go, but what are the similarities? And I've already given one, that we know what it's like to ignore God for our own, to build up our, our own selves. But let me give you a little bit more. Because as much as I, I've never been in exile, I think I've been in kind of an exile. I think we all have. 
I remember going on vacation in the first week of March in 2020 and coming back, not knowing that I was coming back to no church. We shut down our youth group. We shut down church. We did, went to church online, youth online, all those things. And we did that for several months. And then in the summer, we got to reopen with restrictions where we stayed far away from each other. And then we got shut down again. And then we were closed down for another several months. And then we came back. And when we came back and we started things up again and we started to have worship, and especially when, when we started to have youth again, and I looked around, and it was so easy for me to look to be perfectly honest with you, at the youth group that we, we had and lament what we once had. Because two years before, when I had gone on vacation, and, and you know, two years ago when I went on vacation, I had left a youth group that was, you know, a, 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 a low-attended night was 60 people. We would have 60 to 90 people in the room. We had pump and worship, lots of fun games. It was a lot going on, and it was awesome. And then when we came back, a lot of people didn't come back, whether they were, you know, some of them have come back now, but some people didn't come back, whether they've moved on. Some of, some of our leaders have moved on to, to different churches some, or, or to different, uh, to different uh, um, cities and different things like that. And, and some of them moved on to different ministries within our own church. And some of the people, we don't know if, they, if they're going to come back or if they're ready to come back and all those things. People were, were still nervous, and it was really easy to look and say, Man, this is not like it used to be, and I'm so sad. But then I had to realize something. We're always going to have those moments when we come back from something and go, this is not like it used to be. And guess what? It's the same thing for all of us. We've come back to church, and it's not like it used to be. Some of our friends aren't here anymore, not ready to come back, or our small group disbanded over COVID or whatever it was. But guess what? We're given new opportunities and I look around at our youth group now, and I'm like, wow. Look at the kids we have now. We had a lot of kids graduate over the two years that, 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 uh, that, that I really didn't get to be with them in those final years, and that was sad for me. But now we got a great group of kids. And, it, and, and they're thriving and growing spiritually, and, and we're starting to see new, new things happen. And all these things are happening because... Because God is working. God is moving. And that's what we see here in Haggai. God promises to restore, to not just restore things, but to move things forward. He's, he, he, res, he promises to restore his glory in Haggai. Well, we've come back from an exile. It's not the same thing, but a lot of the same principles apply. So whenever you're reading a book, you can ask yourself, what's different, but what's similar? And have I ever experienced something similar to this? And I chose Haggai because we've all experienced a bit of an exile. We've all maybe returned to church. Maybe you haven't even returned to church yet because, because of health concerns, and, and we understand that. But we look and say it's not the same as it used to be, but God is still working. God is still moving. God is still on the throne. Now, in Israel, in Judea, the sign of God's presence was the temple. And in the New Testament, Jesus, in explaining what's going to change to a woman from Samaria in John chapter 4, says, the day is coming when you will worship in spirit and in truth and not at a specific location. And that is the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament, between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Jesus removes location from the equation. Do we still gather together? Yes, it's a good thing. We are instructed to do that. But we can worship. Spirit is not capital S spirit. It's lowercase s spirit, which means your spirit, your being. Worship God with all that you have so that you move forward and that you are worshiping God in, in, your, in your daily life in all that you do. And truth is, worshiping God genuinely, honestly, from where you are. And that's not always at the top of the mountain. Sometimes that's down in the valley. And so I will close by saying to you, the Bible is relevant. It has moments of racial tension, which we see today in our world. 
it speaks to moments to, to our shame. It speaks about things that we are ashamed of. It speaks about things that we love. It speaks about family. It speaks about how we share the good news. And, and every passage, when we think about the differences and similarities between us and them, can start to be made relevant to us today. I chose a book that was obscure so that we could look at how an obscure passage can actually apply to us today. But the truth is, is that that happens over and over and over again. Before we go, I would like to pray for you. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your word. Lord God, we thank you that you've given us good reason to trust that your word is good. And Lord, I pray that you would um, help us to understand that your word applies to us today. That even though there might be a lot of differences and it doesn't apply exactly the same way, that the principles still apply to us today. And I pray that you would give us the tools and the eyes to see how parts of the Bible apply today. That there are things that, that, that fit with what we've gone through. And I pray that you would open our eyes and give us eyes to see those things. We love you so much. We thank you that you have replaced the, the, our location of worship, that we get to worship you wherever we go and love you wherever we go and honor you in all that we do. We thank you that you died in our place so that we could be made known by you and so that you could bring us into your family. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. As a final act of worship, we want to give you the opportunity to worship God with your tithes and your offerings. This is a chance for all of us to honor God with what he has given us. And I want to thank our entire Calvary family for your continued generosity. It's because of your generosity that we've been able to continue to minister in our community through Night Shift and the City Dream Center, uh, through partnering with churches across our nation, as well as helping out internationally with things like the Ukrainian Relief Fund through the churches that we sponsor in Ukraine. So if you would like to partner with us, you can donate by following the information at the bottom of the screen, and giving is safe and easy. Before you go, I'd like to pray for you and your giving. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for every giver and for every gift, and we pray that you would take what comes in and multiply it and use it to further your kingdom, whether it is here at home or across our nation or somewhere around the world. We pray that you would do great things as your kingdom is built in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, God bless you, and we'll see you next time.